Good afternoon. Welcome to this wonderful place. I'm Laura Hopman. I'm the director of the drawing, the, chief, the executive director of the Drawing Center in New York. So I'm a guest, but I wanted to thank, um, from the bottom of my heart, Pace Gallery for bringing me here to have a chat with Arlene and the wonderful exhibition she has at Pace, and also Beth Rudin, DeWoody, Maynard Monroe, and everybody here at the bunker for having us and giving us such a beautiful reception um, to, to have this little talk. It's fantastic to be in Palm Beach right now. That's for sure. Even though it was kind of warm in New York, it still wasn't very warm. It's not the same at all. And no ocean situation. And no ocean, exactly. And no ocean situation. So, but it's wonderful to be surrounded by this magnificent uh, artwork and even um, in a room with the work of Arlene's that's right behind you. Um, that uh, maybe we'll re refer to during the discussion. What we thought we'd do, if this is all right with you, is Arlene's gonna give a quick tour of her career, uh, very quick, and then we'll uh, do a QA. and a we'll, we'll have a, have a discussion, then we'll open it up to uh, people in the audience to ask uh, uh, Arlene uh, some questions. For those of you who don't know, although I think everybody does, Arlene Sheckett is a New York-based artist, born and bred in, in New York City and she's been working for, can we say 45 years? <laughs> About? Forever. Forever. That's what the Italians say. When you ask them where they're from, they, or how long they've been in Italy, they say, per sempre. So yeah. we'll say that for Arlene. Arlene has been working in New York as an artist forever. <laughs> and one of the many, many notable things about Arlene and her work is that she is a sculptor who works in many, many, many different mediums. And that's something that is eternal fascination for me because it's not just, she's not just playing with them, but she is uh, an adept in uh, so many uh, different techniques in, uh, for three-dimensional object making that it's astonishing. Sometimes you can see it in, in, in an individual uh, work. Um, you went to the Rhode Island School of Design. And for, where did you go for undergraduate? And, at NYU for, uh, for undergraduate, real born and bred. And uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Arlene, who's gonna flick through the slides very quickly to give you an idea. For those of you who don't have a good idea of Arlene's career, uh, we'll have that as the background. Yeah, so it's almost, I just pulled almost a random selection. Um, and uh, this, I, I had a 20 year survey at the ICA Boston Oh, and I'm so glad it says it there, in 2015. Uh, and that was the first, so it was many, many rooms, and that was the first room going back to 25 years ago. So it was really a 25-year survey, and that I was dealing a lot with the iconography, Eastern iconography and thought, and that follows me to this day. Um, this is the main room uh, of that show where I had started to do ceramics. Um, and I'm showing this particular image because that uh, tall one with the blue hair on top, that piece is now, can be seen right now at the Norton. So it ended up in a, having a good home and two days ago I went and was so happy to see it and the Norton by the way is just spectacular really an impressive place oh I'm gonna go back so uh, this was a show that um, I was invited to do at the Phillips collection in Washington DC this was in 2016 and hang the works of other artists along with my own sculpture. So they approached me saying, we're heavy in painting, but we don't have that much sculpture. So can you do something? And it was really, really fun. Right there, really, really fun and challenging. Right behind these pieces are a whole constellation of wonderful paintings by Forrest Bess. And that is a, that is it's a, a kind of um, red thread through your practice, especially the past 20 years, is the mixture of uh, curating, juxtaposing your work with other uh, work, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Um, Morris Lewis and me. 
Oh, but I know, actually I'm gonna point this out because somebody just introduced themselves and um, Francis Good was, uh, owns that blue piece that ended up by, yeah. Oh yeah, Bonnie Clearwater is here. Yeah, so there it is. Uh, with the great Philip Gustin. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, this is ridiculously random. So fancy, <laughs> which was in my Pace show, uh, um, best behavior. And then th this is a work that's up now um, at the Hirshhorn. So all any of you who are around Washington DC, there's a, a great show um, called Put It This Way, curated by Anne Reeve from, um, from the collection. And I am so fortunate to have that sculpture next to these, this outstanding Joan Mitchell. Um, as I think it's gonna be up until September. And uh, on the other wall that I'm not showing is uh, beautiful Alma Thomas paintings. I mean, there's just spectacular, Lee Bontaku sculptures. It, it's, it's, it's a great show. Um, but here's a ripple and ruffle uh, and the other side. So I'm showing, I'm showing uh, works from more than one point of view because that's what I do, is I make things that are transformative one view to the next. Here is the sculpture, uh, Beth, the, yeah, that you, that can you see, see behind, behind. you. Right. And, and this is, but I'll turn it around for you. Um, and so what I'm really trying to do is I'm a believer, and I'm going to have Laura talk about this, yeah. but I'm a believer in the idea that the art, that sculpture does a wonderful thing. It creates a choreography um, for the viewer. So the things can stand still, but if if I make it in a good way, or it challenges people to actually walk around the works. So that, yeah, exactly, so the, it, it, the movement is in with the person. Right. And that, in fact, is something that is a, a, one of the, the uh, um, characteristics, if you will, of, of modern sculpture, yes. i.e. post-war sculpture, whereas a, a, a monument of course, you can walk around and you must walk around a monument, but it's not something you have to do to be able to experience the entire, I don't know, Arapachis or something like that. But, he, but in this, maybe in that case you do. Sorry, wrong, yeah, wrong yeah, suggestion. But, but Lincoln, the Lincoln Memorial, let's give an example. <laughs> but so can you see Lincoln, you get Lincoln, you don't have to see the back of Lincoln. Link, um, but in this case, with, a, with this kind of sculpture, you need to inter, your body needs to interact with it. Yeah. And um, this notion of interaction, along with the notion of juxtaposition, is one that is something that really comes up in this, in your, your practice because of the, the, the variety that's within it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, the, the links that I was making to myself was the connection between um, uh, putting work like yours into art history, mm -hmm. juxtaposing it, say, like you see here with Sheila Hicks, who's somebody who's uh, uh, older than you are, but. Uh, mm -hmm. Is she within 15 years? I think she is. So the yeah. same generation, or Joan Mitchell, which is an earlier generation, but each one of these things illuminates more about the work and gives you a context and a history. Right. So I put things like that with your curating because um, Arlene has several times taken it upon, uh, been asked to, sorry, like we did <laughs> at the Drawing Center to, uh, to curate an exhibition. And what you're seeing, you can just click through these, are installation shots. The benches are Arlene's sculptures made of uh, single pieces, uh, the main parts are in single pieces of wood, trees, and she's um, hung uh, drawings from the Renaissance to the present from the collection of Jack Shear, who uh, lives uh, in New York City and upstate and has been collecting for less than 10 years but has uh, more than a thousand works of art 
uh, all of them, all of them drawings. And Arlene did this incredible um, uh, sort of Gesamtkunstwerk hang oh, with the way that, that she word. divided <laughs> an all-in-one artwork, where she divided the walls and hung us hung on a rail, and then created these benches. These contemplation benches, and they're even little grooves for your rear end. They're fantastic uh, objects. Um, and uh, in fact, in this, in this uh, yeah. group of, uh, of slides, there's another uh, place where you, were, you, you curated as well, right? There's another curated show? Well, the Phillips the Frick? Collection. Ah, yeah, the Phillips Collection. And you were also asked to uh, install Frick? your work at the Frick yeah. as well. Yeah. So this, this, this and the Rhode dialogue Island with the, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rhode Island School as Museum, well. Museum, yeah. I think, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question. Why do you think that, um, that as, a, as a sculptor, people ask you to do these things? Is it, is it because, I know this is a yeah. funny thing to say, but I'm just going to throw it out there. Is it because your work is abstract? Ooh. Oh, you mean so people can see? They're looking for a narrative or a context. Just wonder. Each situation was actually very different. Well... You would know because the Drawing Center approached me for this show that we're looking at right now, but I think, um, first of all, as a sculptor, I don't think a painter would be asked to do that as much, but, although they have, do you think but as a sculptor, you're dealing with space, and so you're dealing oh, right. with that moving things around. So somebody like you should know how to do this, i.e., Right, oh, right. So and I completely adore installing. Like, I was just being nervy enough to tell one of my collectors here, like, where they should put the, <laughs> put the work. But, you know, even coming down to um, Palm Beach, you know, I figure things out a little bit in the gallery, and I hope you will see the show at Pace if you haven't. And then I come in and it's just so, there's like one moment of distress where, oh, this looks like shit. And then I can get to work. Like it, the worse it looks, the better I like it. When I first walk in, then I can get to work and really make the magic happen. And I just adore that. And I do think that, that um, I'm not the only person with that talent, but not everybody likes installing. Like, I know artists who do not install their own just let shows, it, yeah. and I totally respect that. I don't think, you know, it, I don't think they need to if they don't want to, but I can't imagine not wanting to uh, myself. And I think, because I feel like it's part of the, you can speak to the architecture, you can speak to, there's, so, there's such richness. Like the benches that we're talking about, I, w I went to the drawing center many times and before I figured out what I was gonna do and I just felt the volume of that room. And I felt like the walls are too far away from one another. I ha so they it's, it's actually true. We really wanted to keep those benches. <laughs> so I felt like I really first wanted to stitch the room together because uh, with these lines. So I was first seeing the space before I was seeing the idea. Then, of course, I started to think, yeah, lines, there are so many ways to make lines. <laughs> and so... I am making lines when I'm carving something, and those are very specific carved lines, but the, the, the hunks of wood, these 12 foot timbers are lines. And, and, and then there's then the, the fact that they functioned with such a, I, such a undermining of a high art vocabulary, something that I think here in the bunker, um, Beth is doing magnificently, where she's allowing things to have humor and breathe and be scaled to people's bodies and mind. You know, it, it's an inviting. There's an in, invitation. And I, at the drawing center, I was not just working with the the vocabulary of the drawings. And I did. I should also say that I studied. On, art history as an undergraduate. So I did, I do have that background and that does help with um, curating, but the, 
you know, art can be seen as welcoming and also sometimes very intimidating. And I felt, especially post-pandemic and with this gigantic collection that Jack Shear had, magnificent collection all over the place, that we just want to gather. We just want to get into that space and sit down and think about what's on the wall. And you were so right. Can you, Arlene, move it along to another, not to, to yeah, maybe go. not to the next one, but to the next one, because I want to talk about something else. Because the reason why we asked you, a good question, why we approached you to, to do this uh, exhibition was twofold, probably threefold, but the two that I can think of was it, first and foremost, as a sculptor, as working yeah. in many dimensions, right, in three dimensions, you, you do understand space, but you also, within your sculptures, you understand the notion of juxtaposition, which is, of course, at base, um, what the curatorial project is all about. This looks like this, this doesn't look like that, this. That's it's kind of the crude, the very crude <laughs> bottom of what, of the way that we tell stories as uh, using uh, objects, right? And within your very sculptures, Arlene, because in, mo in many of them, this one I can see has three powder coated steel and glaze, and glaze. Very often you have three to four, even five different techniques or probably more mm -hmm. in one particular sculpture. And, if, and of course, the, the, the reason why they're wonderful is because they, they cohere. That said, they're also um, are not shy about the fact that they have many different uh, stories going on to go into one, to make one larger, larger theme. So that notion of juxtaposition is something that you do all the time. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's interesting that you're talking about that in relationship to the curatorial too, but addressing, addressing the individual artworks and the mixing of materials, um, I am using a lot of different materials and techniques and sometimes, you know, color and texture, but I'm trying to have them cohere. I'm not trying to say, oh, in this piece, figure out what the ceramic is and look at that. Figure out what this, where the steel, how, what the steel does. I'm trying to have all of that melt away. I'm trying to have it really ultimately just be a thing and, and, and rise above what the materials are. And yet. And yet use, use, use them, seduce, do the whole thing, but also become something else. And yet, I mean, it, and I mean, for to use an example, yeah. the, our obvious Good. example is the use, your use of ceramics. Yeah. Um, I'd love to know when you began to use ceramics, but you know, it's, uh, it's hard to think about as, it's hard to believe in a way sitting in the, in the bunker here that's so chock full of wonderful sculptures made of uh, ceramic material. Yeah. But ceramics is an, uh, is an art form that has traditionally in America, particularly, been considered a craft form. So somehow Absolutely. a lesser form, not to mention the gendering of such a thing, uh. which is also a feminine rather than a, than a masculine thing. Yes. It's also finally anti-monumental. And Arlene, the, the, the couple of works that you're showing uh, we, we're showing are, are, are fairly small, but you're, mm -hmm. you also make monumental works yep. out of ceramic, which is, um, again, sort of not something that you would expect from the uh, medium. So what my uh, question is, is that, is there something different? I mean, how do you, first of all, when did you start using ceramic and how do you consider this medium given that you're um, doing this? Um, I mean, if it, what it, I, somebody's got to correct me. So uh, maybe Mylan knows this, but isn't it called the? Is it the old um, the uh, Renaissance notion of um, uh, ranking the different kinds of arts? Is it called the endoxa? What? You've never heard. <laughs> Arch, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't mean to put you on the. He's a he's a, a librarian, so I'm putting him on the spot here. I think it. Somebody else. I might hope know. it's called that. Sounds I, so the, good. The top. The top is is architecture. So architects rejoice. Uh -huh. Below is music, monumental sculptures three, right? Wow. Bronze, of course. <laughs> history painting, four. So it's history painting, and that's the, you know, everybody else will get drawing. away. Drawing. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's what 
that's okay. We're low, but we're subversive. Uh, yeah. But uh, even even below, the, the, the well, that's doesn't why include it's printmaking. History. Doesn't include yeah. printmaking. But I guess what I'm saying is that monumental sculpture making mm -hmm. is that if you if there's like a, a kind of superhero lineup for the history of art, the superhero Michelangelo is one of like the Superman, right? Because uh, and and his ilk because the, he made these big monumental public sculptures. Yeah. Okay. Well. <laughs> But you're Most of the world, thing. if I say <laughs> that I am an artist with, and people don't know me, they will absolutely assume I'm a painter. So there goes that yeah. idea. You know, because that's in our contemporary society what people think of as art. Just because it's more available. And I did used to teach, um, you know, in art schools, and I was constantly amazed at how students felt so intimidated by doing sculpture, but not intimidated. And here we are, we're living in a three-dimensional world. We are three-dimensional ourselves. And painting is completely an illusion, you know, and people somehow are less intimidated by that, I, I'm amazed. Uh, so anyway, that's Maybe an aside. Maybe it's harder. Maybe it's harder to make sculpture. It's, it is, it's way harder. I mean, it, it's painters? hard. It's, oh. <laughs> time, <laughs> time, time is involved. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of time involved. But anyway, going back to your original question, I started, the, that ceramics was marginal marginalized was the attraction. Uh, so I had, you know, dabbled in ceramics, then I got serious and went to art school, and then I was working in plaster and paint and all kinds of other materials that were in that first room uh, of my uh, survey show, and then, um, Summertime came, and some of you might know Betty Woodman. Uh, so Betty called me up and said, oh, I'm going to Italy, and I have this assistant. I don't want to pay for the summer. So would you, you know, can you give her some work? I was, she can do, you know, plas mixed plaster. She can do whatever. I, so I, so Leslie came and worked for me two days a week, and I said, I think I want a hobby. Uh, and so maybe I'm going to make some, uh, I have just been to India, some, uh, some lam lambs, gas, bur you know, oil burning lamps that I saw in India. And, uh, and I, as soon as I started to dig into it, I got really happy. Uh, and then Betty came back, I was like, oh, all right, I guess I have to, you know, figure this out. Yeah, because actually her assistant was just, uh, didn't know that much more than I did. And, and so we just, but well, that was fine. Betty didn't, she just needed her to do what she needed and I needed her to do what she did. And so I felt like there's the place, like as an artist, there's so much opportunity in the holes. You know, like now this, now that ceramics has, so then I, I was showing ceramics and I just remember, this. so that was, I had my first show at ceramics in 2000, of ceramics in 2007, the next year, and, um, and, and I was, here's, here's an insider piece of sto little story. So I was doing that, and then I heard that Barbara Gladstone was gonna put together a ceramics show because she had a deep love of ceramics, and I was like, and oh. And she had Rosemary Trockel, who was also. Right. Yeah. And and then some and uh, Andrew Lord. Oh, and when Andrew Lord, great, yeah, a great ceramicist. Now he's a ceramicist who also is a fine artist. Whereas yes, yeah, right. and so I tried my hardest to get somebody from Gladstone to the to my studio to no avail. Uh, <laughs> like uh, I even knew, you know, whatever. 
and I just, and I had, I was with a gallery that I was thinking about leaving, and I just said, okay, forget it, I'm gonna do a show and open at the same time. And so I did. <laughs> so I did, and then, you know, Roberta Smith came and, you know, talked it up and, th and said, oh, ceramics, that is one of the ancient, she actually did this really great review that included history of ceramics where ceramics was the first abstract painting, is, was her premise. And she then, um, it sort of took, took off a bit from there. Not other people started to do it, but in 2012, I got this call from Art in America and they said, we're putting you on the cover with ceramics. Can you believe it? Ceramics is on the cover of Art in America. That what, like almost, like, why would we, we're taking, we're elevating this lowly material. So already it just, you know, the hierarchy was even 15 years ago was just much, much more entrenched. And all of the art schools, and there weren't that many that had ceramics, had taken out all of the equipment, you know, in the last 30 or 40 years, had taken it, thrown it all out. And then now, suddenly, I get all these phone calls all the time, like from Skowhegan. Oh, can you help us? Can you consult with us? I'm building a ceramic studio. They, you know, in, in 1900, they had one. Then they got rid of it. <laughs> so it, it's been like that. I have an even a practical question, since we're on the ceramics issue, which I think is fascinating. As when you're, when you're working with it, um, how do you reconcile how different it is from much hardier uh, materials like, say, metal, because ceramic is, I know it's hardy. I mean, you, I've, I've seen things from, I saw things today from the 12th century, uh, Chinese ceramics, but still, it, it breaks. So you're juxtaposing it with metal and also with wood. There's a, that uh, engineering knowledge that we've spoken about with you. You know, um, it's one thing to make a great sculpture, but a great sculptor can make a great sculpture that doesn't fall down, <laughs> right? Uh, and, yeah. You are one of them. No, you have it, that ability. It, yeah. But I'm not, I mean, the, the history of sculpture wouldn't exist if I, I, everybody who makes sculpture that has existed for a long time has uh, made a sculpture that doesn't fall down. And years ago, I did a series for the Metropolitan Museum of Art about Greek sculpture and, you know, how those how those things stand up. This I know. Is, this there's a reason. It's not, it's not, it's not a beauty pose. It's so that the, that the thing can stand up, right? Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Sorry. And, 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 and yeah. so if you walk up and down the, the arcade of the Metropolitan Museum of Art with all of those marble st statuaries, you will see that there are trunks, like tree trunks That's and right. stuff attached <laughs> to the to back. The, back or the legs of the guys and I always used to when I and I just think it's hilarious because it's both phallic but it's also why those things are standing standing right uh, engineering feet and so yeah. everybody to make a sculpture that's bigger than your the palm of your hand you have to figure it out or even the palm of your hand you have to figure it out and that is an entertaining challenge um, but I just want to put in a word for how we, civilization is basically measured and viewed through the history of ceramics. It is so much hardy, hardy, yeah, they dig things up and they, they say, oh, here, this thing, this Egyptian thing, this, all, all of these things have existed forever. It is so much hardier than people think. I, I, I worked for a few years at the mice and porcelain factory, we literally would drop things on the floor and they would bounce up. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's it, high-fired porcelain is as strong as stone. It is, it becomes like a stone. That's amazing. Yeah. It's, what you have up here, oh, go back to the one, oh, or it's the same one, isn't it? Yeah, I'm looking yeah. at it. If, you, if it looks weird, I'm looking at it here in small. Yeah, that's why. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I wanted to, this, this um, reminds me of um, another uh, area of discussion that is often uh, uh, undertaken vis-a-vis -vis your work, and that is that um, uh, we alluded to it earlier in, in our talk, which was 
putting you in some sort of art historical context. And when I asked you the most annoying question that any artist gets asked, which is, where would you put yourself in the history of art? Or, you know, who do you look to, et cetera, um, after berating, and you should have, that's right, saying, ugh, she rolled her eyes. But she, you talked about, it was very interesting because it was not where I thought you would go. You talked about British sculpture, and you talked about Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth. And if, could you go back? The one you didn't talk to, you didn't talk about Anthony Caro. Oh, Anthony. No, but and, Anthony Caro's genius. Yeah, but the, the, what, what do these three sculptors have in common, other than the fact that they're British mid-century? This is the thing that struck me last night. I was lying in bed. They're horizontal. Is that, is that one of the reasons? Not, no. I mean, because you're really a vertical... Look, I think, two I, I, think I was saying don't talk well, about Henry Moore or Barbara Hepworth. <laughs> I mean, like, I don't have those people as references. Interesting. But I have... I'm hungry for anybody. Like, I, I'm, I'm happy to look at anything, anytime. I have to say, I very... Catholic in my taste, but you you see why I was especially oh, with this I see one what you're because saying. you know the beauty of the uh, one of the one of the innovations of Caro or the innovation mm. of Caro is that he he traveled his work right he literally he made land, uh, uh, a sculptural landscapes that looked like they were yeah. uh, traveling across an expanse but not this way this way right like a like a landscape like this well, one obviously he, he yeah. made all kinds of things and by the way um, yeah he. Yeah, and he used found things. So a lot of that stuff, yeah. he would go to the metal yard and pick it out and put it together and, and say, boom, boom, boom. You know, he had his assistants move things around and then he'd say, now get it to stay together. But you don't, you don't use found objects. That's important to, to I, note. I, I think I do because I use wood. And I use wood in a way that you, like sometimes I'll have it formed, but like that piece we saw at the Hirshhorn, you know, that is, that is a trunk that it has all kinds of amazing drawing in it. And that came from insect, insect drawing in it. I left it. I left all that original information. So is that using a found object? It's not, it is, you know, I, I always try to have a kind of wildness retained in the finished sculpture. So you, you could see, like actually that piece that Beth has, one of those lines was there when I cracked open the trunk. Of the, of the wood. Oh, I of see. Of the wood. Found and lines. then I followed the right. lead. So, you know, my imagination isn't so good. I just know how to see that, oh, yeah, that's a good move. That's a good mark. There's a slide a little bit further on called, I think it's called drawing or on drawing. Can you oh, yeah. find that one? Um, because, of course, that's one of the, the, yeah, that's here. the third, speaking of drawing, right. Speaking it's of drawing. one of the drawing. third reasons why we uh, asked you to, uh, to do something at the Drawing Center, because you've always said in interviews, et cetera, that, that drawing is enormously important to your, mm -hmm. to your practice, not in a preparatory way, but right. in a sculptural manner. Can you explain to us how drawing is, how, how this sculpture relates to drawing? Well, first of all, I'm just going to use... Uh, drawing in space is what sculpture is. True. Uh, so, and so, so that's it. That's number one, the number one bottom line. Does it have to do with the... Uh, but I do yeah. not draw in preparation for making work because um, I draw as a practice separate from making the work. If I, I really like to and believe that um, my job is interesting over the long term, working over the long term, because I don't 100% know what's gonna happen. So I, if you're an artist, you better figure out, you know, how to keep yourself interested. And that's how I keep myself interested. So I am, really committed to being present in the moment as I'm making the things and as I am um, making every single decision in real time. 
if I drew, then I just become a worker. Yeah, I mean that you try to I, reproduce. I just, yeah. I just try to to reproduce an idea I had from a from a you know days or weeks or years before. That's just not interesting to me. And that's how Anthony Caro is, you know, really the master of uh, of making sculpture because that's what he spoke about and he did. Too. I didn't actually know that until a few years ago. I didn't either. That's interesting. But, yeah. but it's true, um, and and so he's the godfather of a, of, of that, that kind yeah. of being being present. And so it's much more a painterly practice. Like you don't. I mean, I guess there are people who draw the painting and then get in there, but. The, the space between drawing and painting is about as big as the space between drawing and sculpture. You're just not going to get that happening. But, so why bother? But let me ask you vis-a-vis -vis drawing and space, and I'm sorry to be so literal, yeah, but look, looking, at this, looking at this work, we, uh, before, as we were preparing for this uh, conversation, we talked about a number of issues, and one of them was, and this is classic for an art history, for every art history grad yeah. student here, and that's, of course, the development, if you will, from sculpture as a monumental object with a core. We we're talking about Michelangelo or the, like a, an equestrian sculpture that you walk around, mm -hmm. or the Lincoln Memorial. And sculpture that um, is uh, interacting with the viewer in space, which started, at least according to some art historians, with, uh, in the West, in, in Europe, in the United States, with constructivism. Yeah. So when you think about constructivism, you think about an object that doesn't have a core but that is something that's capturing, that's capturing space. And that's what this object seems to do. And you can't help but not see the metal rods as carving space in a way a drawing would. Except yeah. it's all wood. This is wood all, also? These it's are all wood. wood. This is wood, all of it. All of it. So that's interesting. So do you also do, do, do trompe l'oeil sometimes? Like do you, do you like to pretend wood is steel and ceramic is wood and no? No, but I, I think that's a, that I'm, um, somebody did once write an article saying, you know, that you can't necessarily pull it apart. I was delighted that that it, it it's not screaming out about its material. I'm not trying. I'm just doing what I need to do to make the sculpture. In this case, I think because I have used a lot of steel in my work, that. That and this, the black parts, people are used to that being steel in my, you know, within the context of other things I've done. So you're not the only one who's made that assumption. If we move on to the next one, we have two other shots. Then there's, a, there's one after that we can talk about. Um, uh, this is the, another uh, issue, sort of red letter issue, because it's, what you're saying is leading up to that, and that has to do with the notion um, of um, abstraction. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and again, I, I have to pre-apologize because this is a quintessential uh, annoying, sometimes people find it annoying. But um, when you ask somebody whether their work is abstract or figurative, some people can, again, is an eye rolling. But, but which is it, Arlene? I mean, is it, maybe it's different. Maybe it's neither abstract or figurative. And the, and the reason why this comes into play mostly is because, because we, could, we could just say, uh, Arlene, check it as an abstract sculptor. But the, the, the effulgence, the specificity mm. of every title literally makes these things personages, like you could meet mm -hmm. them in the, the grocery store and say, you know, teasing and squeezing here, and then ripple, what's the other one? Ripple love and it. ruffle. Ru ripple and ruffle over there. They're two, like, <laughs> they're very, the, the names are so specific, so I, I put that to you. Um, is it, um, is it, what was I gonna say? Is it abstract? Is it or abstract or figurative? Is it narrative? Um, is the narrative coming from what it looks like, or is it about a, a sort of a formal narrative? Because I'm not saying that a Mark Rothko, by the way, has no narrative. It is about something, but it's but he's he's using color in order to to make us understand what it's about. Yeah, because yeah. I don't believe in abstraction. Just period. I mean. <laughs> You know, I don't, I, I, I just think... There's no such thing. I, I, yeah, I, the line doesn't, the line doesn't exist. Uh, so between abstraction and representation, um, 
I think my experience in making art and my experience knowing a lot of artists, there's always something happening that in your alone time with this artwork, you're in such a deep dialogue. I, in order to be in that dialogue, and I call it listening. So you listen to what this thing, you start a work and then you listen to what it wants to be. So then it has, you know, it's not, it's, it's a complicated voice. So that's why I, I just can't identify with representation or figuration and um, as, as poles. And I think if I'm somewhere, and also because I am trying to make arts, artworks that have gesture so that they're so, not little soldiers what do you looking mean, at you. Move, that it moves, that they move or? No, that um, somebody else I was talking to here, that, that, that they hold secrets so you wanna bend down, that, they, that they're gesturing to you, that they have, like we, uh, that they have something to do with our experience of being alive and in a body. So that it means that they have a position, you know, that they're they're not um, they they have attitude, like you know, there's a little attitude happening in that piece. There's a little attitude there. There's there's this space, like space underneath that piece. I'm gonna just. See, so that cantilever there, I'm gonna reference it with something else that is figurative. I was, again, at the Norton with the Charlie Ray sculpture out in the garden a couple of days ago. The, he actually, Anthony Caro is his guru. Wow, really? Yes. Charlie Ray is one of, is, is completely about formalism. And I, you know, have heard him give lectures about Tony Smith and all, the, all those abstractions come from very solid grounding in the history of art. And that, anyway, that Charlie Ray, the way um, Jim has his, has his hand almost on Huck's back, that space underneath is like this space I'm trying to create there. It is like the space underneath is the power space and has, you know, in this case, there's a cantilever and a funny little pointed leg that speaks to something about Greek sculpture or, you know, a peg leg or some, some, something, but a heaviness and a lightness, a, 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 um, a comic, physical comedy. Do you think physical comedy. Are they meant to be funny? I think it's funny, yeah. This particular one? Or well, I think general? it's funny, yeah. yeah. I, I, I always think that when, when I think that something is successful, I feel like oh, it, it, has, it has to have some humor in it. It might not be, I, and I really don't like um, art that has a punchline, so it has to have some kind of humor, probably, maybe a lot of times just to me, but I, it has to have some humor, and I think that goes along with that idea of being alive and in a body. And, a, you know, a, like some, it, ha, it has to have, human richness. I mean, we talked about uh, color, uh, sorry, we talked about technique, but we haven't talked about color and texture. Yeah. Can you skip towards the, the, this is one of my favorites, this is one that's in the, in, in the Pace show, but in the back room, the red one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this one. No, and oh, that, that one isn't in the, is, is not in, in the back room. Oh, there's an, another oh one I don't know if I have that picture. 
There's one it's that looks it, like yeah, it. Sorry. A, a little bit. So, but anyway, is, we could talk about the color. It's a tabletop sculpture. Yeah. Um, and with this, you know, very bright red color, and the the texture is extraordinary. Yeah. I was talking to you about it in terms of food because it really it looks. But I called it toothsome because it looks like something that you could that not only you can feel but you could also taste, or maybe even the surface of a tongue. Tell me about how those kinds of things also play into the narrative of the sculptures. Um, you know, that is glaze. Um, it is tough stuff and it looks soft. So there is that idea that you were talking about before. It's an you know, creates this illusion. Would you like people to touch your sculptures if they could? Yeah. Sure. I know I'd like to. I know Pace doesn't like us too, but <laughs> I, I mean, I looked around and went. <laughs> I People touch things all the time. And honestly, um, that's another way ceramics is amazing. Like, that could be hosed down, literally. That's true. And, and a painting is the most fragile. A painting or a photograph are really far more fragile. I mean, there are some textiles that we have to worry about, but ceramics is not one of the things that you have to worry about. And I'm very, very aware of conservation issues. And so that's one of the reasons, you know, I'm, I'm using glaze because it can take light and it's tough. Actually, I'm looking at it now. I can see it's different than the one that yeah. uh, I was looking at. I think the one that, that's at Pace has a purple uh, support. Is that? Is yeah. That, it's so beautiful. It's this, um, it's not lavender. It's this sort of a true purple. And I, I asked your husband, I said, did Arlene do that? He says, yeah, yeah, she painted that. That's extraordinary. Do you see where it is? The support here is gray. It's just, this is this functional thing that's holding this thing up in the, uh, up in the air, but it's really part of your sculpture. It's 100% And the color part. was like, whoa. Yeah. So, and in yeah. this case, for instance, in this one, I have the plinth it's standing on is exactly the same color as as that um, painted steel. And people separate the steel part from the ceramics part, but it's really one thing in terms of how I'm thinking about it. So in terms of the color, in terms of all parts of it, um, it's very important to me, for instance, to have the, the you know, how are, how are those colors coming together and, um, the biggest thing or the most embracing thing I can say about color is just that I think it's a language. So that, that we can relate to color outside of it. it like it has, outside of, of it having specific meaning, it just, you know, it just is and people react to it. And I feel like people are born with their own sense of color. Um, and or not, and that your you know attraction to different things relates a lot to what's happening with your relationship to color, and and that's one of the reasons I am choosing to use. It. I feel like I started this series, this particular series of smaller works during the pandemic, and I very move, move to the yellow one. Yeah. I very right. specifically felt like we are all not getting along <laughs> and we need another language. So I, so I thought, okay, like, let's just have, art can do that. Art is a way for, for people to converge and share feelings and thoughts without being in conflict, hopefully. I mean, I think that's, I, I had one more question, that, but I think that, that that's a kind of a beautiful way to, 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 to wrap up, because I was just looking at the, looking at the time, but because we I want to give a chance for people here to ask questions, because I know that there are friends here, some people who own your work, who live with your work. My, what I was interested in was uh, to, to chat a little bit about scale, because the scale has changed recently uh, between these uh, sort of, uh, vertical monuments that are life-size and bigger to works that are, I guess you could call tabletop, even though the table is included. <laughs> uh, 
Um, it's not in a. It's it's not in a line. It it goes back and forth, and I privilege myself with being able to do whatever the hell I want to do at any particular time. So I do lots of different sizes of things depending on how I wake up in the morning. I think that that the the humanistic um, part. I mean. It's, you know, you learn in art history graduate school that all art is political, of course, everything is, every person is political, et cetera. It's not necessarily, you don't have to have a picture of Chairman Mao to make a political work of art. And what you had, the way that you've explained it really makes uh, a huge amount of sense, at least uh, to me, that these are human objects that you're looking for human responses to, and there, uh, there you have it. Can, does, do, do people have uh, questions, inquiries, comments? Chemistry, <laughs> the wonderful world of chemistry. So, so um, people might assume that I'm placing each dot. I'm not. I'm there's. It's a technique, and then the effect uh, of the technique. First of all, my work is very often fired multiple times. So as the coat as the things are coated, it, the, it, getting the proper thickness, because I want that, that breaking up of the surface, I have to keep firing it to get it thick enough so that it doesn't come off, but yet it separates itself. And so that's, that's just something I figured out over time. Intentional. Uh, well, it doesn't always co-op. Things do not always cooperate, and I'm sure you've heard ceramicists talking about how you get things out of the kiln and it's a surprise and stuff like that. But um, I'm not a potter, so I don't make that much stuff. And so, but this and the stuff I do make. I am taking a very long time to make. And so I'm not gonna take more risk than I need to. So I am testing and testing and testing over and over and over on different size things because even I can use the same glaze on something this big and this big and it will come out different because the heat retained, the, the, in the, within the object completely ch changes the way the glaze behaves. So it's pretty wild uh, because you, you, people will know ceramics retains heat. That's why there are those like beautiful Swedish stoves. You know, it's, it's a great medium for retaining heat. So if you're making something really big or even that size, it's gonna be, the color is gonna be different than if it's this size. So anyway, that's, it's just testing. So I just keep at it. I just keep at it. It's, and that's, the, and, and I'm lucky enough to have an assistant who helps me do a lot of that really boring testing. Anybody? Okay. Anybody else? I have a, I have a yes. Okay. Okay. Is there a dream collection or genre of art? Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, if, is there a dream collection or genre of art? Um, it could be American. It could be anywhere in the world where you would love your work in conversation with that work. MoMA. <laughs> Is it at MoMA yet? It's not, and it's just been, and they actually, they're all, and, and that's, it's in every other New York institution. That's and that's fascinating. And there's 50, 50 museums, and that is a predisposition, I have to say, against ceramics. Against ceramics? From, from the get-go. Now I think it's not, maybe I, not, but if you, Start As an ex-MoMA person, the first thing I thought of was, oh my gosh, it's not geometric enough. It's too biomorphic. 
Isn't that funny? I mean, it's so... Well, uh, I mean, it's another just crudity, have a great... but still, you know, it's, if, they, if it was six colored boxes, yeah, yeah maybe I mean, rather than... It's, it's, but, you know, it's really... In, I mean, no, because it I'm is talking interesting. about seriality, it for is... example. I mean, if something's oh, serially repetitive, it's they the language of, of post-war American yes. modernism. They're like, yes, yes, I'll have that. Because, yes. in fact, the museums are in, in the business of telling stories, and hopefully the right. stories are getting bigger and bigger. But in fact, um, even in some of our big museums, we're telling a pretty specific story there. And maybe that's what it is. It's Although, interesting. I mean, maybe... When, when the curators yeah. change, mm -hmm. you know, things, things, will, things will change. It's just had the same people in the same place for... Making and it's and it's a surprisingly small. I mean, I have huge advocates there, um, but I, so I, I don't want to say anything no, but bad I think about that MoMA because so I'm also saying, way yeah. I mean, how can you not want to be? Uh, it's my hometown place. But what if it's what? It, maybe it has something there. to do with the way it looks or what it says. I mean, maybe it does have to do with biomorphism or or you know a, a kind of latent surreality or something like that. That would be fascinating. Yeah, or, or female yeah. problems. Yeah. Just, should, as, I don't as know a curator, what to say. I, I think we should send a phalanx of psychiatrists yeah, I, to all the museums and ask them, you know, why do you like this? Why don't you like this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of that kind of uh, aversion. But it's a, good, it's, a, it's a good it question. A good I'm question. trying to think, you know, I'm very, very fortunate to be in a lot, amidst a lot of great art. And... As an artist, that's just the most wonderful thing to see yourself. I mean, it's great to have a one person show, but it's amazing to have that kind of dialogue, like just that. Um, and that's why personal collections can be elucidating to the extreme, you know, that, that it's very eccentric and that kind of, eccentricity I love but here Sheila Hicks she's an old friend I'm gonna take that picture I'm gonna say hey Sheila I'm thinking of you you know like so it's 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 a it's a pleasure um, and there is one other uh, place the Louisiana Museum Hummelbeck Denmark which I have not been to but I, I have uh, but uh, you know, and, and, and being a woman isn't, you know, Europe is even worse than America, if that can really be true. It was, it was, it was um, explained to me, well, when I went to the Hirshhorn opening, the, it was explained to me that 10% of the collection is women, which is one of the highest percentages in the country, but of that 10%, 4% has been shown before. Uh, so, and then I was talking to the woman from the, uh, the great curator from the San Francisco Museum of Art. She said, oh yeah, if we, if we don't collect anything but art by women from now to the end of this century, we will not approach equality. On that note. On that, that note. <laughs> I want thank you very much.